Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Dark Parade. Uh, my name is Bo. I am your host for these proceedings. I will be joined momentarily by Gary Hill of uh, Cinema Beef and Two Drink Minimum fame, as well as Last Call of Torgies, a number of other shows. G uh, Gary does a lot. We are doing the second episode in a mini-series all about The Gate and The Gate 2. And if you listen to the last episode, which I invite you to do so, The Gate is a flawed but really, really interesting movie. Now, The Gate 2 is a different animal altogether. And I don't want to spoil the conversation I'm going to have with Gary, but uh, suffice to say, this is not necessarily a love fest the way that the conversation I had with Mike was about the gate. This is more a an examination of how things go wrong. And I think if you if you listen through to the end of this episode, we try to establish here is how the gate two became the gate two in light of the fact that this is, you know, some of the same performers, the same creative forces behind the uh, gate two were therefore the gate. And so how did things go wrong? What happened with uh, the gate two? And yeah, I don't know that we get to a completely satisfying answer, but we at least ask that question. And it's never fun to do a bad movie just to sit around and throw shade at it. That's not what I enjoy doing unless you're listening to a show called Pick Six Movies. Uh, no, I for this discussion, I really want to look at it more in terms of, you know, it's not fun to watch a bad movie. It's certainly not fun for the filmmakers to make a bad movie. But how does a bad movie happen regardless? And so that's what I was trying to get at with this episode. And, and you'll be the judge of how successful I was in that. But uh, at any rate, without further delay then, let us get to uh, the dark business of the gate two and welcome as always to the dark parade. Hey there everyone. Welcome to, uh, yet another, uh, dark parade. And with me as, as promised, as threatened as, as was prophesied, uh, once more is Gary Hill. Uh, how are you, sir? Much like in the film, things are turned to shit. Probably I'm fine. I'm doing okay. You know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. We, we will get to it. So just by way of setup, uh, obviously if, if people are listening to this, I would recommend listening to the, the previous episode on the gate, uh, which is, you know, not to spoil the end of this episode, but I would argue a far superior film, but this movie is really interesting because it is not a sequel that immediately apes the the previous movie like the one the one thing i will give this movie credit for is that it does not just try to be another the gate now i don't know that it's successful in doing any of the new shit that it is trying but i respect the fact that the, the writers and directors of The Gate 2 uh, looked at this opportunity and said, you know what? We're going to do something different. And uh, as I like to do on on these here episodes, uh, I like to start by asking, like, what is your experience with The Gate 2? Did, did you, was it something that you saw as a kid? Are you new to this? Well, The Gate 2, I think, my, my first viewing of because right, I think they played a bunch on HBO, mm -hmm. and uh, my experience with the gate, the first one is it's the first horror film I ever saw at my uncle's house, and he had like a little collection of pre-recorded videotapes, and he had like four or five, and the gate happened to be on one of them, and it's the first one I ever saw. So I had to see knew that there was a gate too. I had to see it, and I had to run to the video store. But like I said, I think they played a lot on HBO. And I think like the USA Network stuff like that. So I've probably seen it more than I should have um, when they were running it because they played it a lot. Yeah. What did you? <laughs> so when you when you come to the gate two, are you like, all right, this? 
like, d were you surprised by th the fact that this movie is kind of different than the game? Like, they clearly could have just been like, okay, we're going to do, you know, surprise, surprise, the gate didn't close all the way, and here's some more crazy shit. But, like, this movie, it, it, Stephen Dorff ain't even in this movie. Yeah, Stevie Dorr, I think this is 91. He had already moved on to do other things besides The Gate. And The Gate was his first thing. They say this is two years later, but it's more like four years later. So, I, I think it is. I think The Gate was 87, and this is like 91. Uh, this is and, 90, and it also was released late. So, like, yeah. this was shelved because the company that actually produced this movie um, ended up... It was... it. The, so the film was shot in 88 and then it sat on the shelf until 1990 uh, when Vision International I think is the name of the company um, that bought the rights to it so it was kind of quick on the heels as far as when it was filmed it was kind of quick on the heels of the gate um, but uh, yeah as you said Stephen Dorf I, when what I've heard Tibor Takas, uh, the director, talk about this, he kind of said this was an issue where, like, Steven Dorff's parents were sort of against him doing a bunch of, uh, a, a bunch more of, I don't know if it was horror work or just work with a movie like this, or maybe they just read the script. Like, any of those things are possible. But essentially, it, it sounds like Stephen Dorff's parents were the ones who said, yeah, uh, Stevie Dorff is not going to be in this. And and yeah, and sure enough, uh, you know, it left the writers with the question of, well, then how do you make a gate two if the main character of the gate is not in it? Yeah. I mean, a year later, you, you, I don't know if you've seen this film before, but it's about a... I think a boxer in Africa. You know, two years later, up the power of one came out, which is probably his biggest breakout performance. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, you know, up until mm, I don't know, Wait, like what are the big Steven Dorff performances? Uh, oh. Power of One. I, I, mean, I True Detective, I, I love, of course. I, I love Judgment Night, which is a film Just, with him, and yes. yeah, Judgment Night is is real good. Soundtrack um, is a banger. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Backbeat 1994, uh, SFW 1994 as well. That's a good one. Um, I shot Andy Warhol 1996. Oh uh, yeah, if you're the a Stuart, Lily Taylor it, movie. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a Stuart Gordon fan, Space Truckers, he's in that. That um, Blade 98. Yeah, they had a pretty good run in the 90s, I'd say. Uh, Cecil B. Demented to year 2000. So if I've never met him before, that's probably what I would get signed something from Cecil. I think. Man, I had almost forgotten he was the villain in Blade. That might be, the, now that we've talked about it, that might be the the central Stephen Dorff performance for me, other than True Detective, which I thought he was mm -hmm. fantastic in. Well, the, the only real villain they ever had was in Blade, the first Blade, so there's, there's that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess you can argue Dracula in the well, he, he wasn't very good at it, though. No, 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 no. <laughs> um... But yeah, so, you know, as we do on this show, we'll, we'll kind of traipse through the plot. This, you know, I don't want to uh, suggest that we are going to dismiss this movie at all. I just think it's going to be a fairly quick look at this movie because not all that much happens in the movie, really. Um, and a lot of it's just, you know, kind of following these kids running around. There's a whole montage of you know, wishing for stuff and that kind of thing. But we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, the, the gate two, as I said, like you're in a situation as a writer where Steven Dorf, the main character of the gate is not coming back. So they pivot and they decide to make Terry the central character. And when the movie picks up, according to the film, it's been five years since Terry and Glenn had their encounter with the gate in the backyard. Um, realistically, it hasn't been nearly that long because Terry would be a grown man <laughs> if that were the case, as opposed to, you know, early teens, uh, as he is in this film. But, um, yeah, so 
Glenn, uh, who is Stephen Dorff's character, and his family are gone now. They have, they have left uh, the state, presumably, on account of, you know, living on a gateway to hell. And their house being destroyed with by, by demonology or whatnot. Right. So, the, for a number of... I mean, it's kind of like the, the reason that the Freelings leave uh, in Poltergeist. Like, you just don't want anything to do with this house. See, no amount of remodeling is going to make you feel safe in this house, house again once your sister has been sucked into the wall by a zombie workman. So, uh, Terrence's family, on the other hand, who we knew was troubled because his mother was dead, had died a, a couple of years prior to the events of the game. And he is still dealing with that. His father, uh, as it happens, is a uh, an alcoholic now. So... He's not doing well. And uh, so Terrence basically decides he is going to take a different approach to the whole situation with the gate, which is, hey, I can actually use this power. I can, I can learn to channel it. And that way we're not just fumbling our way into demonic stuff as happened in the first movie. So he, he, the whole idea is I am going to put on the headset, uh, for the drive through at Hardy's and I'm going to use this, this book and a bunch of lasers and I'm going to summon demons. For his own, his own means, which is, it's doomed from the start right there. So, right. Yeah. The, uh, once again, we are dealing with forces that we should not be toying with. In the first movie, it was all accidental and really the fault of one of, uh, Al, the sister, one of her loser friends throwing yep. a dog into the hole. Uh, had that not happened, we probably would have been cool, but you know. That's what you get. And, yep. And, but yeah, so that you're right. <laughs> In this case, we are absolutely uh, invoking the powers of darkness instead of stumbling upon them. And so, because he says, you know, well, we we did it wrong. We we'll do it right this time. And assuming that they intended to open a gate to hell in the, in the backyard, but um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So. He goes to Glenn's old house to start, you know, this ritual, which, like I said, it's a bunch of lasers that he set up uh, around him. And he basically is going to try to use the forces of evil to make his father less of a loser. Well, that's what you want, right? You know? Yeah, I, like, I get it. I, I understand that from a character motivation point of view... Terrence is like, hey, my life and my family sucks. And so it would be great oh. if I could harness the forces of evil to make that situation better. Not to shove ahead, you know, too 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 long ahead, but he has a conversation with somebody in this movie. We'll talk, talk about her in, in a minute, I'm sure. Um, about how he walked in his father with a gun walked in on his father with a gun in his mouth. He didn't want that, that to happen again. So to cure those those depression slash suicidal drunken blues uh he's gonna make his daddy a pilot again using mm -hmm. demonology <laughs> right yeah because uh, whatever went wrong when you made a deal with the devil like history and literature are riddled with uh, uh how that worked out for everybody uh in the end and so he he's going through this ritual and then thinks that he has summoned a demon, but instead he has just summoned three miscreants, uh, John, Mo, and Liz, who is, and, and all of these characters are of all these characters. The real star here is Pamela Adlon. Yes. Um, who was on Louie, been on a bunch of stuff. The, the, the voice of Bob, Bobby Hill on King of the Hill. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, so she is, this is one of her first roles, if not her first. She's very young. Yeah. She very, yeah. It's, it's shocking to see her, um, this young for sure. Not, not, you know, I'll throw another one. Grease too out there. She's in that. She's not as young as she, she is here, but, uh, she's, she's younger in Grease too, obviously. 
Um, well, okay, so Grease 2 Wait. was 82. And then she was uh, on The Facts of Life. Um, she was... Uh, did some television. She was in Space Camp briefly. And then... Uh, oh, she was in Say Anything. I don't remember her from that. And then... Um, this is kind of her big starring role. I don't remember Grease 2 on account of not having seen it. Oh, you're missing out. <laughs> eh, I don't, I don't know that I am. Uh, Grease is not for me. I, I saw the original Grease and I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> yeah, but Grease 2 is incredibly horny in all the right ways. So, so, let's put it that way. Grease know? is horny too. It well, is. That whole movie is about everybody trying to get laid. And yeah, I... There may come a time when I am forced um, to <laughs> to uh, watch Grease 2 because of a dating scenario. But short of that, I can pretty much guarantee I will not see Grease 2. Uh, are, 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 you are you listening, Chad Cooper? Pick six movies, okay? It could be a thing. So just do it, man. You know. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, God. Yeah, that, right. Those are the two scenarios. I'm with uh, I'm with a lady friend who decides that she wants to watch Grease 2 and she feels like I need to see it, in which case I, w I will relent, or uh, it is a Pick 6 Movies episode. One of those two things will have to happen. Um, but yeah, so while John and Mo are, you know, kind of screwing with Terrence and uh, breaking the stream or breaking the, the laser, you know, his... Uh, the, the impenetrable fortress of light around him to keep him from basically keep the spell from going wrong. And very early they're like, uh, we don't believe in any of this. And so we're going to, we're going to screw with you. And unfortunately for John and Mo, uh, Liz, AKA Pamela Adlon is into it. You know, she's like, Oh, this is demonology. This is something I'm super fascinated by. And we should help, this kid Terrence complete this ritual and so they kind of mostly go along with it you know like John is Liz's girlfriend and it our boyfriend and he seems to be going along with this strictly because he understands that if he doesn't he's going to be in Dutch with the missus uh, but yeah sure enough it kind of works um, out pops one of those little minions that we saw from the first movie. And uh, when they see it, John, the uh, Liz's boyfriend, just whips out a gun and shoots the thing. And presumably kills it. And then it's like, hey, in, in what is a head scratching moment? Because once you did this, you would want to, or I would want to, interrogate Terrence and find out everything that led to you shooting a demon. But instead they're just like, eh, we're out of here. And so they take off leaving Terrence alone with this dead demon body. And, and though uh, he's what, uh, eight, 10 inches high, this little minion, I would think, mm -hmm. or in, and you know, as the movie would have us believe. Um, but yeah, so Terrence just like picks up this dead minion and takes it home, uh, and puts it in a, a jar where he can, you know, tap it and see it looking dead and whatnot, I guess. Like, again, this feels like we dodged a bullet here. We, you know, it, the fact that a... Uh, this did not get blown up by the police or something, because if I were John, I would immediately be going to the police and letting them know I had discharged my weapon at a demonic entity and they need to check Terrence out. And then they say, what weapon? I have an unregistered firearm in my possession. You're going to jail, son. You're something like that. Who knows? <laughs> right. I mean, whatever it takes, man, I just came across the forces of evil. I just want protection at this point. Like, that is the thing that separates me from characters in this movie, where I'm like, I don't want nothing mm. to do with this. This is all going to go horribly wrong. And nobody seems to be all that 
upset about the events of this moment. Well, right, right from jump, you know, when they're they're saying, you know, what what she would wish for, and they're putting all their their shit in in the in thing to hopefully have their wishes granted. They're they're all about you know getting ahead, obviously, and but it doesn't work out. You know, it goes goes tits up, and I gotta say for a, a demonology bit here. Not a pinch of salt is present. You know, I've watched the supernatural to know the assault it and burn it. You know, that that's how you get it done. But um Yeah, shout out to think... Kay Pollock, who would be the first to tell you that you need salt. And iron. <laughs> salt and iron. That's the two things you need. Um uh, yep. yeah, so Terrence takes this thing home, and sure enough, at a certain point he realizes that oh, it, the wounds of the gut shot <laughs> like uh Tim Roth and Reservoir Dogs has healed up. Um, I can't believe he summoned me, Larry. Uh, so the jar rolls off, you know, the counter of the table where uh, it had been sitting. And now this minion is just loose. And, you know, I, like he ends up making his, his wish with this demon because he's now keeping it in a birdcage and basically uses it like a little genie and wishes for his father to no longer be an alcoholic and like you were saying earlier basically his father uh is like you know what i woke up this morning decided i was gonna stop drinking and by the way i'm gonna get a job working for this big airline and that's the point where liz comes over and they start to realize, like, oh, we can use this thing to make a bunch of crazy wishes. And, like, it, the way that you do that, or at least part of the way you do it, again, this is all kind of messy. Because does, does Terrence burn anything to make the airplane thing happen? Oh, the... the... Because I don't the wings that the, the oh right like right like the generic generic flight wings you would get like from the captain on an airplane or something you know <laughs> right that, that, uh... it was, yeah come here Bobby you wanna wanna take a look at the cockpit you ever seen a grown man naked <laughs> pretty much yeah <laughs> and it's yeah those wings and yeah but so she decides Liz decides she's gonna burn this little car thing that she has and so she gets a car and. Then John and Mo get wind of this, and then they start burning money so that they can make a bunch more money. And it's like, this is the, the part of the movie, the whole middle section of this film is just them making wishes and getting their stuff. And then Terrence kind of getting closer to Liz as all of this is going on. And am I like I don't want to rush over no, it, but no, that's no, kind of what's that, going that's, on. That's accurate. That's accurate. You know them find this out and holding this creature captive in a very flimsy container because it can get out anytime it fucking wants to. Obviously, because it has claws and teeth and is vicious. And if we knock over that stupid jar, we knock over that stupid birdcage, and then all all is revealed. Um, like I said, once John and Mo get to break into Terry's house after you know. Terry's scamming on, on John Squirrel. Uh, they they start making some wishes and, <laughs> and all that stuff. And yeah, so while John and Mo, sure enough, all right, let, let's talk about the dinner scene because we talked about that briefly. So they go to dinner, and this is the point where uh, elsewhere. Terrence and Liz have realized like, oh, after a few days, all of the stuff that you wish for turns to shit. And that's not metaphorical. It's literal shit that the, this stuff turns into. I assume because of demons. Well, they, they, they tell the, the way to describe the demon they have is like, you know, the big boys, well, he's the roadie to the big boys. So he's a real low level, low level demon as it is. So the way Terry describes it is that these wishes have a half-life. And when he realizes that everything is turning to sh shit, that includes his wish for his father turns to shit, I guess. 
his alcohol his alcoholism comes rushing back to him all at once and cr crashes a plane. I think. Yeah, yeah. Kill. I think it. while still. I think while still on the ground. I think. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. weird. Just, he backs Cause, into cause the airport. They, they make no mention of that other dead passenger passengers. So I don't know. Yeah, and one presumes this was uh, a minor crash or whatever, but yeah, he's back on the bottle. And um, so Mo and John go to dinner at a super fancy restaurant where they're acting really obnoxious, but nobody is kicking them out because they're throwing a lot of money around. That is until uh, I think it's Mo who throws down a stack of bills, and as he throws it, it literally hits the plate as poop. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. I don't know what it is. There, there's a real <laughs> double take where he's like, whoa? Um, and sure enough, they go to Terrence's house to get some answers as to why their ill-gotten gains have turned uh, to feces. And that's where the minion gets loose yep. and ends up infecting them. That's a neat twist, I think, you know. It, I, yeah, I wish there had been more of this than all of the leprechaun stuff. Mm -hmm. But the back end of the, like the, the last act of this movie is they're now infected by demons and are slowly turning into the John in particular. Um, is this, you know, he, he like gets demoned out first and they chase him to some factory where, where Mo works. Yeah. And he kills Mo who comes back as a demon. Well, Mo has a heart attack. They, 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 it's mentioned early in the film that he, he takes pills. He can't get too excited because he has a hole in his heart. Right. So Mo... Mo gets too excited and Mo dies. And he's, he's the second sacrifice. Right. And so they, uh, Terrence, um, runs afoul of the big demon, which is John, who is like all completely metamorphosized into, uh, a demon that's not as big as the one you see at the end of the gate, but it's like a big, you know, eight, nine foot tall demon thing. He's much taller compared to Mo, though, which I kind of like. Like he's like he's like the alpha of, mm. of the demons, you know. Oh, for sure. And they end up getting Liz, and basically scurrying off with her. And there was uh, so earlier in the movie, Liz and Terrence use this jewelry box. Um, that belonged to Terrence's mother as a vessel of light, like it was sort of like the rocket ship from the first movie. Like if, if we get into trouble, this is going to save us. And so he takes that music box with him to, and I quote the dark world where, uh, which is just the California desert. And they are, they, they've got this, uh, like, Star Trek-style altar where they're going to sacrifice Liz. And they're like, oh, by the way, Terrence, surprise, surprise, you're infected too. And so Terrence looks down and realizes, like, uh-oh, I got me, me some demon hands. And they tell him, like, okay, as he slowly kind of turns into this demon, you're going to have to sacrifice Liz. But uh, what happens is before he can go about killing Liz uh, by stabbing her on this sacrificial altar, the music box tumbles, opens up, plays the music, and he has a real like, what? Oh, I've become a monster. And so he takes the music box and throws it into the gate of the title which is the whole idea is like oh you're gonna sacrifice Liz she'll be the final sacrifice and then the big demon can come out and yeah that it should be said that the demon the, the little miniature demon is already inside the music box that's why it makes the noise because right. they intend to sacrifice him the little demon to right all the wrongs that they have made yes 
And so uh, Terrence, Demon Terrence, grabs this music box, throws it into the gate. It explodes. And then all of a sudden everybody's back on Earth and Terrence dies. And the movie ends. Surprise, surprise. We're already at the end of this movie. The movie ends with a funeral service where, like, Terrence's dad is there and everybody's crying. And then all of a sudden the coffin opens up and Terrence comes out and is like, what happened? And then Liz helps him out of the grave and they kiss and they run off together and then John and Mo come out of the coffin and they're okay again and then if you stick around through the credits you'll also see that uh, the hamster that John used to uh, open the portal at the beginning of the movie uh, is also alive again again oh, I didn't stay for that <laughs> yeah and much like the original The Gate, like once you close the gate, everybody is alive again and everybody's well. Not that this makes a ton of sense, but that's how it goes down. Well, she, if you look at the, what she's holding, she's holding some kind of, like some kind of brush or something. And she says she has the big book of demonology. She's rubbing some crystals and shit. And I take it that she took some kind of passage from that demonology book to to make it all right for him to, for them to come back again, yeah. But then again, it, it's kind of like um, oh, what's the movie? Teen Witch. At the end of Teen Witch, you think that for <laughs> using these witch powers again, I'm using a bad example here. But she she had these witch powers, you know, to to lure the the man of her dreams. You think she would learn something from her mistakes that she made in the movie, you know, losing her friend and blah 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 blah. blah. But no, at the end of the movie it's her dancing with the man of her dreams which she's her goddamn witch powers but she learned nothing from you know their mistakes by bringing them back just to give us this nice little happy ending where even the hamster lives you know yeah but again you're probably right about this but also that is not by any means explicit in the movie like that you're you're not that you're inventing it but also it's sort of like well i guess that's what happened but this was never established that she was like, yes, it's established she's in, into demonology, but at no point is somebody like, well, there's this passage that'll help bring you back if something yes. goes wrong. Nothing like that. Yeah. And, and so the movie just kind of ends there. Um, and so as, as we like to do on the show, we'll get into the ins and outs of how all this fits together in a minute. But uh, first let's talk about the cast. Uh, which includes Lewis Tripp as Terry or Terrence, um, who was the second banana in the gate and has moved up to the lead here. And he's kind of fine, I think. Like, I don't think he's an exceptional actor or anything, but he's he's fine enough. Um, yeah, he's, he's done like these two films and like one other thing, and that's that's about it. And I've even tried to like look for him to contact him for like interviews and stuff but it didn't really happen let's put it that way you know? yeah and then you've got Simon Reynolds as Mo who is maybe as far as all the secondary characters go maybe my favorite just because he's really hamming it up in this movie uh, like I said he, you know the scene where he throws the money down and it turns to poop like that he said, he's wiping off the bill I forgot to mention that did that scene he's wiping I don't know he's wiping, wiping the, the shit off with probably with a napkin or something yeah yeah it's and he's gone on to have like a, a long career you know he's been working steadily for years and years like popped up on warehouse 13 uh for a season um it was in what else uh P2 that thriller P2 that's a good one yeah um, undercover brother, he's in that. I, I enjoy it. I don't I, say it's I the like best thing you're gonna watch all week, but it's funny. Undercover brother is pretty good. Um, 
And anyway, but, you know, been working in movies and TV off and on forever. And like I said, I think he kind of understands that the movie is real goofy and, and sort of leans into that. Um, then you've got James Vilmer, who is in, um, uh, who plays John, the, the boyfriend of Liz. And he was kind of old at this point. Um, like he was in his early 20s when this movie came out and he worked pretty steadily up until eh, he was in his 50s late 40s early 50s and you know well uh, same kind of situation he was in a handful of movies did a lot of tv and then was just kind of done no notably the movie he did right before gate 2 zombie 5 so you know if you like them terrible italian zombie movies he was in one of those. Or is this the official sequel? Uh, you know, Zombie 5 is an unofficial sequel. And so, so, there you go. Mm-hmm. Got that going for it. And so, and I, I, I think he's kind of the weak link for me. I just think he didn't give a shit. Like, this is a movie that feels like he was totally phoning it in. Uh, but then again, I guess if you're coming on the heels of Zombie 5 and you're doing The Gate 2... You're just like, ugh, I don't know if I want to be an actor anymore. <laughs> and uh, and then you have Pamela Adlon, who is really uh, energetic. Like, she is absolutely the actor in this movie that you're like, oh, I can I absolutely see how you went on to become a name and a star. Um, I don't like I don't think anybody acquits themselves that well in this movie, but far and away she is the one performer that's like, oh, you've you've got something. You're you're an actual actor. Could be another pick six pick of the future. Um, underrated in the Sergeant Bilko film adaptation. I, I, I love that film. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, it's, it's got a cast that I like. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think that's the way to approach it. Is that it has a good cast. I would not. I would no go would not go so far as to say it's a good movie, but but I'm like her voice work alone is just incredible and you know she had a great career still has a good career like she is uh you know still doing n almost nothing but voice work but who cares you know <laughs> like that is that is the kind of work that i would love um don't forget, we live in a world where, where Clancy Brown is Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob SquarePants, people. So, right, like, be doing that stuff. I mean, she was on Rugrats. That alone is probably putting her kids and their kids through college. You know, not to mention, like you said, she was Bobby Hill on King of the Hill and was in, oh, good Lord, uh, the new Thundercats. She was on the Pound Puppy Show. She was on. Uh, what else? Uh, Phineas and Ferb. Um, she was on Louie. Um, you know, the much maligned Louie now. Uh, did a, a bunch of voices on Bob's Burgers. Uh, Pete the Cat. You know, like, just everything. Everything. Like, she does voice work all the time. And, uh, it, Wilfred's pretty great. She's on that as well. Yeah. With, um, Elijah Wood and the, and the, the dog, the man dog. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> and, right, so, like, like I said, she has absolutely been the one to go on to be a big star. And rightfully so. Like, she's really talented. And even in this movie, which is not great by any stretch, uh, like, watching her perform, you're like, oh, okay, you are you are fun to watch. I like watching you on screen. Um, so, yeah, she's, she's terrific. Uh, anybody else you want to call out? I feel like those are the, the big actors there's uh is it neil munro is the dad and he's just a real sad sack but he's also not a very good actor yeah yeah that, that's about it those are the ones you need to know really that's the four core main things yeah I, I think so yeah it's anyway so um let's get to sort of what we think about this movie and a rating and uh, you go ahead. You, what what is what is your takeaway from the gate two? Well, I like you know they had the same writer and director of a film that I love, and I love this one less obviously. But I don't I don't hate what they did here. I, it just 
it's just less than what you had there. It means less of a story. Um, it's less, it's less effects, but I think the effects are still done incredibly well. Although in the first one, you had a whole bunch of those little guys and the kid, uh, the budget, I've listened to the commentary from the first movie and watched the little, little videos, uh, little extra special, special features. The budget and the, the 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 methods they use to make those things look small and big and you know move around. I love stop motion animation. So the final scene with the altar was gold to me because it was a combination of decent looking creature effects you know, with makeups and stop motion. I, I kind of dug that quite a bit. Um, but I'm not gonna tell you not to watch The Gate Two. I, I think it's a wor- uh, uh, worth it to watch. I'm not saying it's worthy of the first one but i'd say um if you haven't seen it it exists on youtube i think so <laughs> start there yeah and if you like it i think a blu-ray exists i so. yeah i've got the blu-ray and uh not as not enough special features i think to make the blu-ray worth it there's you know sort of a discussion between um i think it's randy cook who did the the effects and mm-hmm. uh uh, Tibor, the director, and Michael Nankin, the writer. But that's kind of it. It's like a, that and some television spots. And that's kind of it for special features. Yeah. And Randy Cook did a whole bunch of other special special effects that people would enjoy. Yeah, he's... I, I, they, like, these are all Canadian guys. and uh, But yeah, Randy Cook is incredibly talented. And you're right. Like, the stuff that they did with The Gate and The Gate 2... It, like that that effects work is genuinely interesting and creative and the stuff they do with forced perspective and when they talk about how they they essentially assemble these shots so that you know you're having to get the actors to move in half speed and things like that like it, it's really creative it's really inventive stuff um, that is you know at, at the very least you can say that for the film but anyway, I didn't mean to step on you there. So No, no, you're okay. You're okay. Uh, where where would you rate this movie then? Is Again, three? One, to, one to five stars. Yeah. You can do half stars. No quarter stars because we're not monsters. It's better than middle of the road. Um, I'm going to say three. Three out of five. All right. Uh, three out of five. I am... Uh, I forgot to mention the, the themes of this movie. Um, which we normally uh, talk about. So I'll, I'll throw in a little bit of that here, which is it's really just about, it, you know, hey, be careful what you wish for and don't go chasing waterfalls kind of thing. Um, learning to accept what you have and not not try to uh, use the powers of evil to make it something else. Um, my biggest problem with this movie, aside from the fact that it it doesn't it does a different thing than the first movie which is cool but i don't know that it's all that interesting it feels it, like i said it feels like this weird blend of the original the gate and the movie leprechaun <laughs> and the the effects work is really good but it feels sillier it doesn't have that kind of narrative propulsion that the first one does. It never gets as like dark and surreal as the first one does. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we'll get to the, you know, some things you don't know about this movie that I think kind of explains this, but I just don't think any of it hangs together very well. Um, I think that it, it's harmed by the fact that in these scenes where you have like Terrence and Liz, you know, falling in love and learning to uh, really like one another and, and so forth that in those moments, Pamela Adlon is just acting circles around this poor kid. (laughs) Yeah. And you're just like, Oh, I wonder what this movie would have been if the lead actor was a little bit better. And I don't want to like, I'm, I'm not trying to just bag on Lewis trip because I, you know, oh, it's fine. Yeah, he hasn't done much at all. Right, he he also. is the actor that he is, you know. Um, but I I just don't know that it was a great idea to hang the movie on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, 
you know, it, it, like I understand that there's this family drama going on under the hood with him and his father, but all of that feels really silly. Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to the first movie, like you have that great scene where he sees uh, Terrence sees his mother coming in the front door oh. of Glenn's house, and it's really good and uh, it's, and eerie. It's a, it's and a great ju- it's a great jump jump moment for me still when you know grabs the kid's face and says you been bad yeah. or some shit like that you know right like <laughs> you know we talked about it on the last episode but the thing that makes the gate great is that it's just throwing a bunch of childhood fears into a blender and and <laughs> and hitting puree and out comes the gate and even the writer michael nankin was very upfront about the fact that he he was in a pretty dark place when he wrote the gate Mm -hmm. and that uh, comes out on the screen. Like it is a really grim movie. And, you know, I talked about it in the last episode, but like coming out of the gate, even though that it's a movie that's sort of aimed at kids, it makes me feel bad. And I don't mean that like, the movie isn't good and so i feel bad watching it i mean the movie is just so like grim and and Mm -hmm. and uh like nihilistic that i I think when you watch that the gate of the child i probably seen when i was about nine years old you watch it as like this is a film where kids are doing stuff and Mm -hmm. you're into it in that sense but you watch it as an adult you could spot all those themes that could really fuck with you you know yeah, like, like you can, you know, watching it now, you can point out the things like, oh, this is about uh, the fear of being left alone. And this is about the fear of embarrassing yourself in front of, you know, your kid's friends and, you know, like are your sister's friends. And like, there are all these childhood fears just stacked up and displayed. And the gate too, I just, you know, in, in fairness... The writer himself said, I I was never really sure what this movie wanted to be. And that's kind of how I feel about it is it just doesn't add up to much. It's uh, true. You know, um, I mean, as a narrative, I, I think we've got to give, give her credit because a lot of uh, sequels, you know, people have complaints with it, especially with like the Never on Elm Street series. And there's so many that flip the script and change the rules of what what the thing can do. Um, and the first one, it's done totally by accident. They open the gate by accident. Uh, this one, he has five years from the events of the first movie to research, and he obviously did, and fi- figure out what and what not to do. Although he's very naive, even still, after reading and researching and being all ready to do this. And I mean, he, he had the... the um, the variable of the of the knuckleheads but um still he was still pretty unprepared for what he needed to do yeah yeah and yeah so i am uh, th- th- this sounds harsh but it you know uh, it is what it is i would give this movie about a one and a half star rating i don't think it's very good i think it's kind of dull i think the only thing that's kind of worthwhile in the movie is seeing a young Pamela Adlon being a good actor and the effects work and everything other than that is kind of a bummer. Um, but, uh, let's, all right, let's get into some stuff that normally I do the three things that you may not know about this movie. I'm going to throw a couple of extras in here because I think it kind of explains a little bit of what happened with this movie. Cause I, I do think the gate is really interesting and good and dark and all that stuff. And so the thing that's most interesting to me about the gate too, is how did this happen when you had people that, you know, can make a good movie. And so the, first of all, nobody wanted to make it like, and, and it's not like they had an idea for a sequel and then got to make their sequel. It was more a situation where the director, when he was pitching other movies around, like they did I Madman between uh, The Gate and The Gate 2. And, but to get a, another movie made, and the, and the Gate was a surprising hit. Like it, it did really well. I think they said that um, next to Porky's, 
it was one of the most successful independent Canadian films ever. Well, it man, it's man, it's man, a song, and you know, the, the poster art, of course, in in eighty seven would sell the movie, and it has great poster art, so it just sucks in right there, mm -hmm. going to the video store. So, yeah, yeah, I was wearing my gate T shirt earlier today, as a matter of fact, and um, but yeah, so the deal was, hey, we'll give you mo uh, money to make another movie, but you have to make the gate too. Because we want to, we want to see if we can get another hit out of this franchise or out of this series, and so that was when uh, they decided, okay, well, we're gonna make a gate two, and we're gonna, um, you know, send the writer off to try to figure out what that is. There was never a clear idea of what the budget was going to be, so you know, the writer wrote this grand uh, script. And there was this battle in the third act with all these like winged demons and all kinds of crazy stuff happening. And then the budget came in and they were like, oh, we can't do any of that. So <laughs> they, uh, the director, Tibor Takas, uh, basically says we had to pull the movie entirely apart, figure out what we could afford to do and then put it back together. Only the problem was when we put it back together, none of it ever really fit right. Um, also hamstringing the movie was the fact that this got an R rating, whereas the first one was PG-13. Is it because all the feces? <laughs> I, I got an R rating? <laughs> yeah, well, that was the thing. Like when they were making the movie, they, they thought they were going to get uh, another PG-13 rating because this mm -hmm. one was you know, equally, um, you know, are in fact kind of sillier than the first one, that it wasn't mm -hmm. as heavy as the first one. And then no. it got slapped with an R rating. And, uh, so it, it limited the audience appeal, but also I think that the movie, it was, you know, like it, it was never going to live up to the gate. And you mentioned the one that was sandwiched in, uh, I Mad Men. Mm -hmm. Don't let our discussion of the gate two take you away from my Mad Man. It's just, it's quite a terrific film, I think. You know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like it's the guys coming off of the gate doing another movie and not being in a position where they just had to make a sequel to the gate. They were kind of doing their own thing. Yeah, I Mad Man's really interesting. Um, and then and then kind of finally in terms of the the various trivia, uh, another thing that was a bit of a bummer uh, by the filmmaker's own admission was that they had cast this Hungarian dancer named Andrea Laf Lafani um, to be the minion. And unfortunately, they, you know, press for time and, and so forth because of the budget. They make this suit for her, but only after the suit is made do they realize, like, oh, she is this little woman, and we have a 50-pound suit that she's carrying around, and so all of the things that we wanted to get out of her from being a dancer and, and that kind of thing, like the, being able to do uh, unusual things with her body uh, and, and create a sense of motion and things like that, they just couldn't do it because the, the suit was too big and bulky. And so it was just a, a story, like Randy Cook talks about how with the gate, it was like, they, they had budgetary problems, but they came up with a creative ways to solve them and everything kind of worked out. And he said, you know, the gate two was the exact opposite where we had all these budgetary problems and we had all these challenges. And the difference was we never solved any of those problems completely. And, you know, he was, he was very quick and very generous with saying, you know, it wasn't the writing. It wasn't the acting. I just didn't have time to do the effects work that, were required and i think that's probably just being a friendly canadian where he's taking a I little forgot bit that. i i i hate to ask you what was the actress's name again that was going to play the the, the the minion uh andrea lafani okay not the same person then i i assume that they, they chose the same actor that would uh never mind i looked up ghost of the gozarian from ghostbusters and oh. i know no, no yeah no. <laughs> yeah di different dancer um but yeah and you know, I like. I think the Gate Two is really interesting because of how 
how far it falls compared to the original The Gate. And here, it, it's way more interesting. Like, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend people watch The Gate 2. I would absolutely recommend watching the 30-minute discussion that the filmmakers have about The Gate 2. Because that was super interesting in terms of, you know, like, hey, when you get into movie making, you think hey, we made a big hit, so they are going to give us more money to make the next movie, and that's just not how it works. You know, sometimes it works like that, but mostly it doesn't. And, it, yeah, so it, it's very, very interesting. Um, but any final thoughts, Gary, on the Gate 2 before we wrap this guy up? Uh, I, I hate to say Tibor would go on to make, a, I think, Spiders 3D for the Sci-Fi Channel. That's stupid fun. So go check that out for sure. Yeah, you know? he ended up doing a lot of like Hallmark movies and Lifetime movies and stuff like that. So, um, you know, he's still working. Good for him. Like he, he's still in the business and I think that's great. It's, it's so fucking weird that these horror directors are making Lifetime movies now. But D David Dakota and um, what's the other one? I think, I think Fred Olin Ray too make those Lifetime and Christmas Hallmark mm -hmm. movies now. They, they fucking make their nut out of those fucking movies. I mean, look, it, you know, you're working with a steady crew. You do your thing. Um, you're getting a regular paycheck. Of course, like that, that's guaranteed money. Why wouldn't you do that? Just just rubbing elbows with Mario Lopez. That ain't no wrong with that to me. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, nothing else really, though. We said a lot in, I, 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 give, I give it a light recommend. Yeah. If you liked the first one enough to, to check out the second one and let that fester for a while on how much better the first one is, that's not a reason to... I'm not saying hate watch this movie. It's just not as good. Right. So right, there's yeah. that. I never... like. I always try to temper it because like, I don't get off on just making fun of a bad movie unless... Like on Pick 6, we do big budget movies. And I like making fun of those movies because it's a, a movie that a lot of people spent a lot of money on. And it was real cynical to begin with. Um, I don't mind that so much. But a movie like this where it's kind of plucky filmmakers just trying to make the best movie they can with what they got. Like I, I don't take any pleasure in, in uh, you know throwing shade at a movie like that. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, I don't think it turned out very good. But I think it's interesting why it didn't turn out very good. Um, like I said, it, it, I, I don't necessarily recommend the movie, but absolutely, if you can get your hands on that discussion uh, from the filmmakers about the movie, I, I definitely recommend that. So, um, Gary, please, where can people find more of you uh, so that they get, you know, a sweet, sweet taste of the hill? <laughs> you can find a majority of my stuff under the on Legion Podcasts. Um, under the beef cur the, the the beef curtain is what I call our chat for cinema beef, the be the butcher shop. Um, look under the, under the that banner on your your Apple iTunes and your your stitchers and all that stuff, and you'll find most of what I do on there. Um, cinema beef, two G minimum commentaries recently had an episode. Uh, Burning for Springwood is going to have an episode very very soon. Last call of torches, and um, Legion Patreon has. It's exclusive stuff, including the bonus. I almost said, I almost said excluding, including uh, the Torchies bonus episodes and a show I do with Mr. Uh, Derek Bourgeois. We're, we're going to record a show next week, at least one. Uh, Blood from the Core has been too long since we recorded one of those, so it's going to be more, co more, uh, more current and cohesive. And um, if you guys are feeling froggy, you want to hop over to the Intestinal Fortitude Podcast Network. Uh, did my my friend uh, Android Virus a solid? He started his own thing up, and he has supported my programs since since inception. Uh, not like not like Bo has, and everybody has. It's been, been great. <laughs> um, look for a show called Untapped Gems, which I do with uh, Heather Powell of the Friday Nightmares podcast. There's two episodes out there uh, for you to listen to right now. Don't torture a duckling and. Uh, the Adventure of Buckaroo Banzai across the 8th dimension. Uh, mm. The theme of that show is films that neither of us have seen before. So there's oh, a, wow. we have a list to, to go through. And um, yeah, neither one of us have seen the film when we do it. And it's always an interesting conversation because if you listen to the episode, you know that Heather liked uh, Buckaroo Banzai, but she thought she was going to dislike it greatly. But she enjoyed really liking it. 
that it's such a weird movie it, like anyone who tells me that they love or hate that movie i'm like you're right you're right that movie it just depends on your mood and where you are and how what what hand life has dealt you all of that stuff <laughs> so um all right man full, full full of character actors that you love so oh check for it sure out. yeah 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 <laughs> goldblum's a tremendous amount of fun in that movie um anywho uh all right guys uh i'll be right back to close out the show thank you again gary and uh and we'll see you next time for sure and there you have it i hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as i enjoyed having it uh i thought it was really interesting uh like i said i i'm really into uh not just stamping a movie as bad but trying to do a little bit of forensics on it and figuring out how how did it manage to end up in this state uh, when the first gate is so much more ambitious and not that this movie isn't ambitious, but, uh, it, it does not come close to fulfilling those ambitions the way that the gate did at any rate. Uh, thanks for listening to that episode coming up next week. Uh, we are going to be talking last night in Soho, uh, one of the more recent movies we we've discussed on this show and finally getting Jamie Jenkins. Uh, aka jamie sammons uh i will never not call her jamie jenkins at least once by mistake when i reference her uh because i knew her way back when i knew i knew her back before brian had never even been heard of uh but <laughs> she is finally going to be joining us not just on a what you watch but on a uh, main feed episode so uh i'm looking forward to that that is a conversation that's going to be uh, a whole heck of a lot of fun and, and while you listen to that episode, I will be on, on the high seas. I will be on a cruise uh, when that episode drops. Uh, so uh, please look for it. I may not be in a promotional place uh, where I can draw your attention to it. So uh, keep an ear out for that one to, to drop uh, while I am away. In addition to that, plenty more coming. We've got uh, more talk. Uh, with with Kate Pollock coming up uh, before too awful long. If if you listen to the last Heart of Horror, oh my goodness, that Mento story is, is a real something. Uh, <laughs> we've got more found footage. Full. I'm desperately trying to to get a Sinister Sunday and AKA uh, Morbid Monday. The problem is I'm also trying to limit myself to only recording about three days a week, uh, which is still almost half the week. But uh, in so doing, it means that you know, perhaps some weeks I, I don't get as much done as I would like, but I'm trying to, you know, it's all that work life balance stuff, trying to, trying to find a way to, uh, keep the shows good and fresh and not feel like an obligation, uh, and bring a lot of energy to them. Uh, but also do the stuff that I want to do. It's, you know, that's the constant push pull of anything that you do, right? Is, uh, you want to do it all the time, but if you do it all the time, you don't do it as well as if you take a little time away and come back to it. So, uh, at any rate, but more more stuff coming, more uh, found footage full, more Morbid Mondays, more What You Watch, and more uh, Heart of Horror, other stuff coming, and that's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back on Friday with a new found footage full, uh, so come back then, and uh, in the meantime, thank you as ever uh, for being part of the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.